Well, good morning and welcome to the 13th episode of Retuning Your Firm. And uh, for those who say number 13 is unlucky, I'm sure we're going to prove you wrong today. But hey, that may be tempting fate. So let's talk about, first of all, did you enjoy your time in Remo? It's a great fun place. So uh, hopefully if you didn't try it this week, try it next. So what are today's themes? Um, on retirement, I'm not sure if it goes in brackets or not, or whether it's inverted commas. Uh, I think Victoria, who's on today, invented it, but I think it's a term that we all respect, and maybe it's something doing other than the, the poor guy with the walking stick, but we'll, we'll see there. Um, we also have communication um, and the importance of the board selling its vision. And lastly, thinking about cash flow purchasing, because if you're not thinking about the bottom half of your PL, you're definitely not doing everything you should do to retune your firm. So I'd like to introduce you to the panel today. Firstly, James McBrien, who is the founder and managing director of Clearwater, which he works very much mainly with financial services, but I think doing a little bit more with professional services, but a very, very interesting business, which doesn't just cover pure comms, but also negotiation and other elements associated with comms, uh, very much working at C-suite level, hence relevant to today's call. Andy McCorkadale, who is the director of Spiral Group, who after a period working in the pensions world, decided that actually he could really do good things for the, in the world of purchasing, working, works very closely with law firms, had a background with Pannoni, as you'll have seen from my note. And he's coming to talk about how you can actually really improve your profitability and your cash flow by focusing on your expenditure, which many firms don't. I think they kind of think if salaries are 70%, why bother about the rest? But the reality is that it's a little bit more possibilities there exist. Victoria, Victoria Tomlinson has been on this show herself, I think, in the audience. So nice to have you on the panel. And uh, she's the chief exec and founder of an organization called Next Up, which um, she will tell us all about because it's a very interesting way of helping not as much the individual, but also firms, because for many HR people in particular and for managing partners, how do you make sure that the baby boom generation moves gently to its next stage of its careers? And uh, Jeremy Beard, who, as you know, has been with us on many of these shows and is the managing partner of Cancy Firms Hayes McIntyre. Uh, now, I would normally say Anne Francesca, but as some of you who are on call last week will know, Francesca has a call with her Chinese colleagues today, which she couldn't put off. So although we are technically in the 28th episode, this is the first that she's missed. Uh, yours truly has been on all of them, but I think that's probably something you'd expect. So welcome and thank you very much. So what are we talking about today? Well, I'm just gonna run through my seven strategies for retuning your firm, which the people who are new to the call possibly won't be, have come across, but I think they're quite helpful just to set the scene. And I'm sure James will have comms views on them, but thinking big, in other words, believing six impossible things before breakfast, Lewis Carroll, and uh, that's something that we all have to do. Remember that you are the power of your relationships, but relationships mean nothing. They're just a, an address book unless you actually reciprocate and uh, return favors. But also as well as thinking big, think small. Think about the angles that will resonate with your key audiences. I think we're really getting into the comms world with that one. Uh, think about campaigns rather than one-offs. That's all about converting an audience into a community. And uh, at the end of the day, you really want to think of your clients not as one-offs, but as a group of people that you're working with a community, in other words. Drop the convention, um, Victoria and I were talking about, sometimes you just have to go for it, go for a risk, go for the new ideas, go for the new services. And remember that speed is of the essence. We're in a limbo state at the moment for six months. Now what's quite scary is that um, when government came out with its um, uh, working from home for six months, if you actually go back and read what Sage wrote, and I'll quote verbatim, working at home for anyone who can to be recommended immediately Followed by three words, in place indefinitely. Now that hasn't really been picked up by the media and it may be something the government won't be very <coughs> thinking about. But if that's the case, we are in a new world, maybe not even a new normal, maybe a new future, hard to say, but speed is definitely the essence. So articulate and market test your assumptions. And if they prove invalid, and, and some will, um, that depersonalizes them as long as you make them assumptions owned but not owned by people amend and pivot in the new direction and lastly and again i think we'll all buy into this all, all managing partners i know be entrepreneurial keep listening and innovating and without any question of a doubt the most important word in that sentence is listening because if you're not listening to your people and jeremy is going to be talking a lot about that today and if you're not listening to your clients you will be out of alignment and you will then not achieve an optimal outcome 
So those are some really good points. Now, they came actually from a town hall meeting back in April from Elena Kudsko of Globsec, Bratislava. And I just thought a lovely set of strategies to really focus on because actually many of the things we're going to be talking about today are covered within those seven. So we now move to the polls, as you probably know, if you've been on these before, and um, the feedback from UK government is, as always, amazing that these results are incredibly valuable in our analysis. And it goes beyond um, actually government. This time it's the House of Lords. And this week out came a report called the Future UK-EU Relationship on Professional Business Services. If you haven't read it, please do. It's a really good and useful document. It sets up very much what can be expected. And clause 19, I won't read all of it because it's all in front of you, but the key wording was this came from a poll that we carried out on the 12th of June, for those of you who were on the show that day. So these polls are not just being mixed, picked up by government, they're also being picked up by the House of Lords in their report. And I think I'm correct in saying that was the only poll that was covered in that report, which wasn't opinions from people who presented, if you follow the logical government stats. So, you know, obviously seen as important. So that's great. So please complete the poll, I suppose it's my message. So what are we going to talk about? Well, let's run through last week's poll finding first. What we talk about there? Well, we talked about performance review process for management team members, if you recall. And because it seemed to me that all too often you try and squeeze the management team, that's the C-suite, if you like, into the partner review process. And it doesn't really work because the role of the partner and the role of, let's say, the finance director are a little bit different. So what were people saying? Well, first of all, they were very much saying that these, these conversations should be positive. So the process should help people identify their strengths, they should get praise, and people should be responsible for drafting their own goals. Um, so those were the three things that people thought were the most important. What were the main inputs? Again, kind of varied, but the main one was previous objectives, which isn't necessarily always the right answer because if you got it wrong last time, it has a hobby and then replicating into this time and into the future. So some people were looking at job pace capabilities. We did a survey in 2015, in fact, um, and I thought it would be quite interesting to show how this changed between 2020 and 2015. Um, as you can see, there, there, are, there are some changes, but the main one was around job-based capabilities, I think, which people were giving a lot less input to this year than they were five years ago. Staying again with this comparison between the, two, five, between the five years, no real changes here, um, but the tools and methods, moderation meetings, came out a little bit stronger, I think, this time. And that's really when people get together to talk about people rather than it being sort of all one-on-one. -on -one. And I think that, again, people are now much more aware of the importance of those. In terms of how often is feedback uh, provided, I kind of, I'm rather sorry for the people who never get feedback. It's only 3%, but hey, you know, 3% is still quite a big number. Uh, more than weekly is probably a bit of an overkill, I suspect, as well, if you're trying to do a, a day job and getting constantly being reviewed. So where does it settle? Well, kind of monthly on the informal is the biggest one there, and six monthly from the formal and possibly annually. Again, there's a lot of research that was done maybe four years ago when we people were saying, well, let's not do uh, feedback at all, but let's, in the sense of not have formal appraisals, didn't use that word, but let's just actually have, give people constant feedback. And you've got a bit of kickback saying, hang on, I can't really plot where I'm going on a medium term basis. If it's just constant feedback coming to me, it's a bit like reading tweets, you know, they just come and come and come and you can't really get any sort of balance or perspective. Uh, to what extent are the outputs uh, linked? Yeah, there's quite a strong link there um, between money and uh, performance. Obviously, you'd hope that's the case, but who's responsible? Primarily the managing partner. Again, that possibly wouldn't surprise you. And how effective are the leaders and managers at agreeing objectives? And this one, again, is, again, if you're in the firm where the manager or leader is perceived to be ineffective. I mean, what's quite interesting with this one is there's clearly a very strong message here that leaders are less good at agreeing objectives with their management team members than those management team members are at agreeing objectives with the people who report to them. And there's a message there, I think, possibly, too. How, consist how consistent is performance reviewed at the end of each management project? Again, that varies, but sort of sometimes I, I kind of sense that this is possibly an area for uh, people to look into because I think if you have, if you're looking at your client work and your typical client jobs, you probably wouldn't be very happy with performance being reviewed sometimes at the end of the project. 
So I sense that projects which are being run by the management team, finance director, marketing director, HR director, whatever, aren't receiving the same consistency of review as would be the case for uh, projects delivered to clients. And I think that's an area where management teams could look into it in a bit more depth. And that's probably the key message I took out of this particular thing. But thank you all for completing it. And now we move on to today's uh, poll. One of the things that you may recall from previous uh, shows is that the one of the most important things for firms is all about strategy and purpose and having a clear strategy and purpose. That kind of has been traditionally always one of the top two or three elements. But I thought, well, let's let's actually do a poll now to understand, well, what's the state of strategy at sector firms? Um, and I did one about five years ago with Roger Martin. So it'd be interesting to see the results. I can't, unfortunately give them to you until next week, but we can do the poll today. So who owns the strategy? Um, fairly clearly split between the managing partner and the board. When we had Andrew Kakabadzi on the on the show last week, week before, he was saying that the strategy and the culture need to be owned by the board. So that we'll, we'll take a view on that, but certainly for, for the group for today, the managing partner, the CEO, is the one who owns the strategy. How often is it updated? Um, not very often. Uh, I suspect that's in the current climate, not the response I would have expected, given that if there isn't a time to review your strategy with what's going on, then I, I know a lot of people, all I heard was the sound of business plans being torn up, as somebody said to me once. Um, so that's interesting that n not being reviewed very often. Now, I, I won't comment on that other than saying that slightly surprises me. Uh, luckily, only 6% of you don't have a strategy at all. I suppose that's a relief. Um, who is the person who's got strategy in their job title or strategy represents a substantial part of the role. Well, I'm afraid 52% of you say no one, there's no one in such a role. Now, if the managing partner doesn't have strategy in their job title, I'm not quite sure what their job is. To me, that's one of their key leadership and strategy are what managing partners are all about. Leave management to the experts. It's a really good place to start. But uh, strategy should really be the managing partner. So, and indeed it is, but it's still, again, 26% as the CEO and the big bulk saying we don't have anyone in such a role, which is a bit concerning, I think, in terms of what are the three things which are in that role. Um, identifying growth opportunities is the one that comes through the strongest. Curiously, I would normally I find that strategic planning is the one that's highest. So there's obviously a little bit of a change there that it's much more, it's a bit more external possibly, whereas strategic planning can be a little bit internal. Uh, those are the key ones that come out of there. Most of the rest, curiously also, and Victoria may be interested in this one, managing the capital value of the business. In other words, making sure that the p asset value of the business for partners is being managed. Nobody seems to be focused on that at all in terms of their top three. So, and yet, if you look at a corporate, making sure that your share price is high, which is de facto the same thing, is actually very important. So there's obviously a big distinction there between the two sectors. Tracking external trends, how do you do that? Informal monitoring, 74%. Yeah, well, I'm not quite sure what that actually means. I mean, I have to give you an option saying none. 10% uh, say so we don't do any tracking at all. Um, nobody's really got a specialist unit or even looking into futurists who are really good people when you're coming to strategy. Rohit Talwa, if you recall, was uh, gave a great uh, show and he's actually doing it again for a North American audience for us in December. So, you know, futurists are, do have a value, but only 3% think about those. Staying up to date, uh, conferences. Yeah, again, a little bit harder in the current climate, obviously. Uh, reading books and magazines, um, subscribing to briefings and alerts. So um, only 3% saying they're not doing any of those, which I suppose is a, is a shame. Uh, um, Working with business schools, 26%, I think actually there's a bit of a missed opportunity there. I think business schools have got a lot to offer in this area. Um, some of the best business thinkers in the world, just because they write the book or the magazine, Hard Business Review, whatever, one of our knowledge partners, uh, doesn't mean to say you shouldn't be work working with the author, which is effectively what working in the business school means. And that's particularly important if you're trying to help people at a more junior level uh, develop their career because strategy is a key part of their contribution to management. Um, so what are the three things that people think are the most important? Well, identifying the important strategic challenges comes through very strongly with 80%. That really does jump. Uh, articulating the firm's competitive advantage is the second one, tied equally with considering why clients use the firm. So the, these are, again, these are Roger Martin's errors of eight errors of strategy, which I thoroughly encourage you to read his stuff because he's my certainly guru. 
Okay, so which are the ones this gets into an interesting place? So which ones have people been most effective in terms of uh, their strategy? Well, the one that comes through strongest there is uh, clarifying the firm's core markets with 65%. And uh, just scrolling down, see if I've missed anything now. Uh, then considering why clients choose the firm, 48%, and articulating what the firm is. Sorry, identifying the key strategic challenges that the firm is facing, 52 as well. So those are the ones that come through as high. And I then kind of cheekily said, okay, what are the ones that you're struggling with? What are the ones in which you are least effective? And it's possibly not surprising that Reviewing the firm's management systems to ensure they support the firm's strategic choices is the one that is the highest, because if you're not putting your management system to support your strategy, guess what? You won't be able to implement it. Uh, <clears throat> lots of research for that. <clears throat> and reviewing the firm's KPIs to ensure they measure the right outcomes. So there's a couple of things there that very much jump out as being areas that are the, the most ones where people feel weakest. And then the third one is identifying the capabilities that are necessary to win in the firm's core markets. When it comes to the comms question, the advocacy question, which is which of these things best describe the way that you would speak externally about your firm's strategy? And <clears throat> James can tell us in a second, but I would be neutral if I was asked is the most popular choice. And we kind of know that that isn't a very positive endorsement and only 20% would be speak highly without being asked. Um, now, granted, only 10% would be critical, so it's not when we're not in a bad space, but there isn't that kind of enthusiasm and energy for the firm strategy, which one might possibly want. So those are my quick run throughs. <clears throat> and I will now <clears throat> hand over to James and I'll give him his five minutes of insights on communications. Um, yes, I think that last uh, result was uh, was was most revealing, wasn't it? I think I suppose it would be interesting to know what I mean, I don't suppose you have the data for pre-COVID levels of confidence in the strategy? Yes, in 2015 with Roger Martin. So yes, I will be able to answer that one, but I don't offhand, sorry. No, you don't have the data now. Yeah, I mean, again, I think I think this, this does boil down to engagement, doesn't it? Because ultimately, um, nobody's going to have enthusiasm and passion if they're not engaged. And of course, one of the big problems we're facing at the moment is, is this level of engagement and enthusiasm. That um, sadly, Zoom um, is one of the limitations of the system, if you like. Um, in the bad old days um, of business travel, um, I remember distinctly going off on a business trip to Munich and was taken to um, and, and got a taxi from the airport to the hotel. And um, the driver took a quick look at the business card and, and drove me at great speed and with great skill and alacrity uh, to the hotel, tipped me out and tore off in the opposite direction. And I turned up at the hotel and found that I was actually at the wrong hotel. <laughs> and so he'd efficiently driven me to the wrong place. Uh, the reason I'm telling you this story is um, we recently wrote a piece around zoom and and what it achieves in terms of you know if you had to choose would you rather have efficiency or effectiveness uh, and unfortunately that is the choice we, we we face unfortunately we don't have the ability to actually meet people face to face and so it's really it's a question of how do we make this channel effective um, i think going back to this point around engagement and how you engage people um, Zoom, virtual channels like this has become a bit of a craze that's just sort of taken off overnight and we're all doing it. But it's also become a bit of a habit. Um, and some people you know, have got very used to it, so, so used to it, they don't really take it terribly seriously. Um, other people are better at handling it than others. I remember talking to a, a client recently and I sort of said, well, how are, the, how are the Zoom pictures going? And he said, well, I have to be honest, some people are better at it than others. Um, and I think, I think that is, that's very much the case. And it's, it really is a case of how do we, how do we master this medium? Um, you know, I think the reality is, is that Zoom and MS Teams have, if you like, proved their worth. And I think, you know, the, um, the financial directors are, are licking their lips at the, the prospect of the savings they achieve. Um, but I mean, at, at what cost? I think we have to ask ourselves. And I think we're, we're learning on the job um, as to how to do this. And there are a few things that, you know, we can get right, uh, which will make for a good Zoom call as opposed to a bad Zoom call. 
yesterday I was talking to a, an investment banker who, uh, surprisingly to me, um, but maybe actually with the results of the American banks recently, um, he said we'd have a very good year. And I thought, gosh, you know, um, this is this is positivity in a in an otherwise gloomy world. Um, and he was talking about how they managed to open and close a deal all virtually. And you know, th this was a relatively new new ground for them. Um, but at the same time, he said, you know, people did need to learn how to use the medium um, because. You know, you don't really want to be looking up a, a managing director's nose who's, who's meant to be inspiring and convincing you. Um, what has happened really is that we've started being asked to make people televisual because ultimately um, there were always people who are better at doing this than others. Um, but actually the skills you need for a television performance are not the same skills that you need um, if you're doing a pitch or doing a keynote address. So, you know, we used to coach people in how to read speeches in such a way that they it didn't look like they're reading speeches. Um, but actually that doesn't really work on, on Zoom or, or Teams. Um, so again, we're now having to coach people in how to be good at, at performance on camera as if they were TV presenters, which let's be honest, um, most of the people who are listening to this are probably not natural TV presenters, otherwise they'd be on the telly. Um, you know, their skills lie in other areas. So again, uh, but it can be a game changer. You know, if you know how to use this medium, you can develop that um, enthusiasm and that engagement uh, that will propel your firm forward. So I think it is worth, um, it, it looks easy, but actually I think like a lot of things, you know, golf looks easy. Um, but to get good at it requires practice and coaching. Um, and it, I think it's quite, it's quite telling because um, recently we were talking to one of the big four uh, accountancy firms and uh, they were saying how in the current environment, um, they no longer, for, for new applications to the organization, they said, we no longer look at CVs and covering letters um, junior people are invited or, you know, young graduates uh, or even non-graduates for that matter are, are being encouraged to create a two minute video of why they think they should come and work for this firm. And, you know, ultimately that that's what's happening at the bottom. Um, everybody has to become televisual. And, and that's really my message. If you want if you want that level of engagement, if you want that level of enthusiasm, um, I think it has to be led by the top. The people at the top need to know how to use this medium uh, to engage with people. Thanks, James. That's really interesting. I think, are we all going to become televisual? I mean, that's an interesting concept. Andy, from your world of purchasing, is, how important is being televisual, do you think? Well, I don't know. Uh, I'm still coming <laughs> to terms with it, to be honest. I think most people are. Um, Morning, everyone. Uh, Richard asked me to um, talk about whether effective buying can affect uh, cash flow. Um, in possibly what could be the shortest presentation ever, the answer is yes. Um, that's it. Um, I think what's more important is trying to understand why firms don't use purchasing as a, as a tool to actually improve cash flow. Uh, anyway, if you if you look at the makeup of any firm. It's the old 80-20 rule, 80% of the income, or uh, sorry, outgoings is spent on the raw material, which is staff. Um, that's rewarding staff for the work they do, and obviously recruiting and attracting new staff into the business. The better you do it, the stronger your firm. But it does leave another 20% of outgoing that a lot of firms just don't look at at all. Uh, I've been doing this for 20 years, predominantly in the pref professional services sector, and there's two reasons for this. The first one and the most obvious one is that that 20% is made up of an awful lot of bits. Um, most firms will deal in more than 50 supply um, sectors. Uh, within each sector, you're dealing with numerous suppliers. Um, so when you look at this cost, it's bitty. It's, it's, it's spread across the business. It's mostly deemed impossible to put together and to make any effective difference to it at all. Uh, but it can be done. And if you can do it, it can make a, a dramatic, have a dramatic effect on your bottom line. 
the other problem that I found is that if people do actually try and get stuck into doing some looking at the purchasing and seeing if they can improve it, um, there's a perception about the value of savings that are made. And a, a lot of the time people can turn around and say, well, it's just not worth the effort of, of doing it. Uh, I was recently working with a law firm where we were looking at a number of areas. Uh, one of them was their office supplies, uh, a very sexy subject. And it, we, we could find them savings of 50,000 pounds, which we could put in place immediately. Uh, they declined to take this up because they felt it was not worthy of um, the time and effort from their side to put it in, even though we were going to do all the work to do that. I looked at it and their gross profit was 20%. So effectively to get £50,000 worth of profit, they would have to generate £250,000 worth of fees. Uh, and in fact, that's what they were doing every year. A quarter of a million pounds worth of fees had to be generated to overpay for paper clips and pens. Um, so I put it to them. And the question I put to them was, if I turned up at your door, <clears throat> excuse me, as a client, offering you work where you could bill me £250,000 a year, not just this year, but every year for the foreseeable future, would you be interested? Uh, and I think you can gather whether what the answer was to that one, uh, and they changed their mind. <clears throat> so I think this is a key part to any business. I think to ignore that bottom level of spend um, is is an opportunity missed, particularly in this, this sort of current climate where any business is looking around for an opportunity or something to do something different that they've not done before to try and generate something extra within the business. If you focus on purchasing, it's not an overnight job. It takes time. But the good thing is at the end of it, once you've got everything in order, to keep it going and keep those savings coming through is, is remarkably easy to do. You just need that, that start point to, to get, you, get you going. But you can release hundreds of thousands of pounds back into your business, which can pay for upgrades to IT systems. It can pay for new telephone systems. It can pay to make your office COVID compliant. You know, there, there is a lot, of <clears throat> a lot of opportunity out there for firms. And I think that realistically, they should be trying harder to, to, to get stuck into that side of it. And I think in the end, whether they use a purchasing specialist to sit alongside them or they find ways of training their a staff member up to be uh, a competent buyer, the, the effects, the improvement in profitability um, will be there to be seen um, very quickly uh, and ongoing year on year. So um, that's it from me. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Andy. As you say, the answer to the question is yes. And then that's the longest speech you've given today, I suspect. Um, Victoria, come and tell us about unretirement, which is a completely different topic, but also is something that a lot of particularly HR people and also managing partners are thinking about in the context of baby boomers now coming up to that um, witching hour. You need to unmute yourself, Victoria. I'm supposed to be an expert on this. Thank you very much, Richard. Good morning to everybody. And uh, first of all, thank you very much, Richard. And um, I have found these last 28 weeks of webinars extremely helpful and so many insights. And thank you to everybody who's taken part. So retirement or unretirement, as we call it. Uh, we've now been working with individuals and professional firms for the last five years, really, working with people as they came up to retirement or as they had just retired. And what's clear is there's a really huge pool of talent, of partners and others wanting to use their skills, but not having a clue how to do this. And there are a lot of people who would love to tap into those skills and networks, but they don't know who those people are or how to ask for the help. So we're now working with EY, DLA and a number of other law firms. And what we found is that people need help with ideas big time as to what they do next. And this is beyond the inevitable non-executive director role. They also need help to learn new skills, particularly um, how to network without the firm's brand and using LinkedIn strategically to win roles. And actually it was EY who said to us, because they've done quite a lot in this space for some years. And they said, we're the only people who get partners to think about the market and make them market driven, which will increase their chances of roles. As an example of some of the things we're getting to do when using their skills, we've got people mentoring, particularly tech entrepreneurs. And initially, senior people were all going, I'm not techie, you know, what can I offer? And there was quite a barrier there. But 
putting putting the generations together, because usually it's a, an older and a younger generation, what they quickly realize is these entrepreneurs know everything they need to about the tech. But what they can't do is things like explain their business plan or explain their business, going back to what James is talking about, articulating their business, and particularly in words that an older generation will understand because often they're their customers or funders. And they don't often know where to start refundraising. And they've really never worked for anyone else. Lots of these people have started straight from university and they don't really know what good leadership looks like. Uh, we expanded this idea in COVID and we now have a free site uh, matching mentors and mentees. And we've got nearly 300 on the site. And the impact that our generation, I'm 65 and I'm happy to say that and I would work for another 25 years, but the impact that my generation can make is fantastic. You can see lots of those stories on our website, um, next-up.com, and Richard will share that. Before our workshops, what we do is get partners to complete a questionnaire. Typically, around 70% say they're apprehensive and uncertain about their futures. After the two-day workshop, or as we're doing it at the moment online, as you can imagine, that completely flips. And we get 70% typically saying, they're excited about opportunities ahead. So this is there's a real business reason to do this in terms of helping firms with those difficult conversations. And I've now talked to so many managing partners and they talk about the cost of the impact of bad levers is the phrase that people use. And also about creating this as a really good, um, creating a vision for people that they can see the future. It's good for morale internally. They don't want to see people leaving unhappy or not knowing what to do or sort of bad levers. And it's good for the younger generation to see that. And the other thing that we're trying to do is we're just starting this. And I would love if anyone wants this, we'll, we'll trial it for free with you. Trying to get partners to get involved with initiatives in their firm. Just about everybody these days has initiatives such as zero carbon targets, mental health, getting more women into leadership, recruiting from more diverse pools of talent. So getting them involved internally before they leave, and it's got to come from the heart, it's not just to be a tick box, but they can start building up new skills, expertise, they can network with clients and go and talk about, you know, what, what would be good and how can I learn and best practice. And this could also help them to find a focus for when they leave and they could come back and help the firm. So I'm going to leave you with three thoughts at the end. Do you know really what it's like to retire? I think there's been a conspiracy of silence around the real challenges uh, of people retiring. People don't talk about how, frankly, how awful it is. Are you allowing partners to glide into retirement? I have heard this phrase, I can't tell you how many times, and I hate it. Because what it's saying is that the sort of winding down, just as we should be helping people to revitalize, contribute to the firm and building up something for the future. And I recognize some people think they just want to travel and retire. But if we can do this revitalizing, it's great for the partner and for the firm. And are you really making the most of the skills once they've retired? You may think they want to travel and put their feet up and not want to bother them. But I can assure you, very few do and they would love to be needed by you and others, and they'll probably do it without payment. And I should say, I've just written about all of this in much more depth in Modern Lawyer, which has just come out this week, if anybody, you, you can subscribe to it for free, so to get that article. And I still go into more depth about what I'm hearing from all sorts of partners. Thanks, Victoria. And again, it's not a topic we've covered, but I always kind of think the baby boomers, um, and I'm one of them, I'm 68, so I can say that happily. Uh, and I don't have to do any of this, therefore, as a pensioner, but the truth is that I enjoy myself. And that's why we're still in the, we're now in the 28th week of the show. Jeremy, you've been listening in today to um, hear about James, Clarity of Vision, Andy saying, leaving money on the table. And uh, Victoria talking a little bit about helping partners coming up to um, a, a new role and rather than just gliding off into the future, actually making a positive effort to get engaged now and then uh, energize themselves into those new places. People being very much, I think, the flavor of the month for you at the moment. So just love to hear your thoughts on what we've been talking about today. Okay, thank you, Richard, and good morning, everyone. I'm slightly nervous this morning following James's comments and uh, whether I'm televisual or not, and, and no doubt he'll be contacting me afterwards to uh, offer some training, uh, which will, will be quite daunting, but, but, but maybe useful. 
Um, but no, thank you to all the speakers. Very, very interesting contribution uh, this morning. Um, before we started, Richard said to me, you know, sort of what's what's been on the agenda this week and, and what's been happening. And, and there were three three words I used, which were colleagues, colleagues and colleagues. And, and certainly um, that remains our number one priority at the moment is, is, is looking after our colleagues and doing all we can for our colleagues. Um, and, and that is starting to be uh, not just non-financial, which it has been over the last few months, making sure everyone's welfare is looked after and, and in a good way. Um, that still remains a priority, but we are now starting to think about financial aspects what 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 can we do do we feel comfortable releasing the purse strings a little bit um, and that might be in connection with promotions and pay rises that might also be in connection with recruitment um, so so we're, we're having some fairly detailed discussions around all, all that area of again what I would call financial and non-financial um, factors in terms of, of looking after our clients uh, and making sure we we talk to them and connect with them is a, is, is a, is a big piece and, and say thank you we all forget occasionally in our, our day jobs and we're, we're all very busy just to take a moment to uh, offer a word of appreciation to our colleagues um, and it can uh, take very little time but mean so much to them so so that's that's something that we're we're at Hayes, Hayes McIntyre continually reminding ourselves and making sure we do, we do that. It is a little bit of a roller coaster still with with changes, um, different announcements from from the government, and certainly in London again with the with the um, changes that are coming uh, this evening. I think that's going to change the factor. So so it is a bit of a roller coaster and we had a discussion yesterday about whether we should keep the office open close the office what we should do uh, we're very keen to keep the office open as long as we can and, and provided that uh, we're, we're not instructed otherwise or for health reasons we think it's not appropriate but you know even if we only have 10 people going into the, the office the, the the marginal cost of keeping the office open is is pretty small um, and for us, for a number of people, it is it is really important that they have that ability to to, to go into the office. So so we're going to try and um, keep the office open as long as we can. In terms of, of, of strategy and and some very interesting comments um, made made on the call earlier. Um, certainly, as managing partner, yes, I am the one that I have responsibility for strategy along with the management board. But it is ultimately, I have the responsibility for implementing it. Um, it is ultimately down to our to our partner base to collectively determine what the strategy is. That's quite a challenge. We're thirty six partners, um, so so getting everyone um, on the same page or close to being on the same page can be a challenge. And it's probably the most challenging aspect of my job. I would say is is that strategy piece. At the moment, we've had a 12-month strategy. Once we went into lockdown last March, we had a 12-month strategy for the period through to next March. And we're currently developing our three-year strategy starting from March 21 through to March 24. But we did have a brainstorm a couple of weeks ago as a partnership group to actually say, where do we want to be as a business in five to 10 years? And that was a, a very important discussion and a, and a very useful discussion that will then drive the more detailed strategy for the, for the next three years. Um, I think enthusiasm for strategy and communication of that strategy is, is probably even more important internally now, given the remote working that we now have. We don't have that opportunity to walk around the office, have a chat with people, share the thoughts of the business uh, from senior people to more junior people. So, so that but the ability to do that, to have a drink together, to, to have a chat it, it has gone away. So I think um, to maintain our culture, to maintain our enthusiasm, actually having some good communication around our strategy for our people internally uh, will be really important over the coming months. So I think as we, as a partner group, as we come to 
define and set the strategy for the next three years, I would then like to have a programme of communicating that to the to our guys and, and making sure they are they are kept informed. Cost control. Um, uh, very interesting comments from from, from Andy. Um, I, I, interestingly, I'm not. Cost control has been very good <laughs> at our firm over the last um, six months. I'm not sure that we have proactively gone about seeking to control costs, but as you will all appreciate in the current environment, uh, there is lots of areas in the budget that that simply haven't and can't get spent. So, so, so. We, we, it has been uh, cost control has been it has been good. I wouldn't say that as a firm we've done anything really proactive to go about seeking to 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 reduce to reduce costs. And maybe that's something something we should should look at. And and certainly Victoria's comments. Um, Richard always says that he likes my honesty. And and when I say we've never really thought about that, we'll take it away. And certainly Victoria's comments made me feel like that this morning um we tend to obviously i think i can't remember the percentage but we certainly have out of our 350 people we have i think it's about 150 who are under 30 and certainly our focus is on uh bringing through the next generation and working with our next talent and and perhaps sometimes we um do forget about the, the the generation at the other end of the scale, and certainly that's made me think about whether that's something we should look at. And, and uh, <clears throat> I think we uh, we lost you there, Jeremy, with the sound. So, uh, <clears throat> James, and um, just sort of quickly, what you know, you've heard a little bit about the the comms challenges, particularly around the strategy. How does how does that relate to you? Yes, I mean, I think it is it is it is, um, it is a challenge. Um, particularly, I think probably um, being able to, if you like, reassure people that um, the boat is moving in the direction you want it to at a time when possibly you don't know that. <laughs> um, you know, there is an element of um, projecting a degree of confidence and and that that people can buy into. Um, even though you don't know exactly that you're going to make it there, um, you know you, you've got to actually provide that direction and show them that that this is where you're intending to go. Uh, you might have to change the plan along the way, but at the same time, you know you still have to have a plan. You still have to have a de destination, um, even if it's the wrong destination. People prefer to have a destination. Um, again, if, you, if we continue with the boat analogy, if you were on a boat and you didn't know where you were going, you, you would feel a little disconcerted. Um, but if you knew you were going to New York and you said, well, actually, we're going to have to re divert and we're going to go to Miami, uh, people would, you know, maybe they might be pleased to be going to Miami instead of New York. I don't know. But I think that's probably what I'd say on that one. Um, what, <clears throat> what you probably need is a navigator to make sure you end up in the right city as well. And I think all too often the, the management, the, the, the role of the, uh, the managing partner is that of the navigator, understanding it, you know, which, which is the city that the, uh, the partnership want to get to and then making sure through the management team that that can then be delivered, which is, I think, Jeremy's point around implementation. Interesting, one thing which I picked up this week, we had uh, Matthew Layton, who's the global managing partner of Clifford Chance uh, on the firm wide leadership. Um, and he was saying, that actually what they have found was that when they were looking at uh, the office and who was going to come into the office, uh, they thought, and all the research indicated, that this would be something that would be particularly attractive to millennials. And he said, actually, that's not what they've been finding. He said, what's actually they've been finding is that the partners who feel kind of lost without being in a room surrounded by books or whatever, who are the ones who are coming into the office, and the millennials on the whole, because the office atmosphere has changed so much, it's almost like a Lonely Hearts Club, are not bothering, they're staying at home. So well, let's just see how that one rolls out. But that's the first time I've actually heard that particular view expressed. And this is so with Clifford Chance, which is, you know, quite a big firm. Victoria, you've been listening to what people have been saying. What, what, what are your thoughts? Well, actually, um, I've got a lot of insights and stories this morning that I want to apply to help people coming up to retirement. And Jeremy, I really appreciate your honesty uh, there, because if we've just helped a few more people this morning to help this generation, I, I think it's a big issue for, for society generally. And I'm working with senior people, but actually this is an issue right across the board, in fact. And 
what you the bit at the beginning, Richard, that you do your six things to think about before breakfast. I don't think there were seven there, but I've written down six. But anyway, actually, all of those I think apply to individuals because what's what we're really trying to help people do is to transfer from being a corporate mindset with that big brand behind, and none of them really appreciate to what extent that brand behind them, how important that is. And once you've lost it, it's like a bereavement, actually. And so actually all those things, it's about, I mentioned being market driven. And what individuals have to do is to become a little tiny mini business. I wouldn't use those words because it sounds terrifying to a partner suddenly going on their own. That's not how they're seeing this. But that bit about being market driven and then all the things, and then picking up on what James is saying, you need a direction that you're going in, clarity. And I'm showing people how to target instead of just thinking of meeting headhunters vaguely and meeting lots of people. Actually, start with plan. It can always change. You can always go from New York to Miami or to Australia, but you need some kind of feeling of direction. Otherwise, it will it won't work. And and that's what we're seeing. So the more focused you are. So all this about strategy and things. I've got lots of stories. I blog about things. So you're you've got me thinking lots of stories there. And Andy, I'm sure there's something I can bring in here about costs and things. I'm not quite sure. Actually, it is because there's something here about people say with pensions, they have an ambition still to earn. Actually, most people quite a lot of money, actually, sort of whatever. Um, but actually what people are saying is when you don't pay the same level of tax, your money actually seems to go a bit further. So there's, I'm sure there's something here, Andy, we can work in about the, the, the cost that base that you need to look at. Yeah, and I suppose people who possibly live in the countryside, again, don't have the, the high rents of London. And most people who are in that baby boom generation pretty much are going to be mortgage free. It would be weird if they weren't. So so I think, yeah, the, the cost side does come into it from that point of view. So, Andy, what, what you've been listening to, to this, I mean, do you find people ever ask you to go out and buy strategy consultancy? Is that something that you find people are asking you for? Uh, no, and, and to be honest, I wasn't that surprised, um, sadly, that um, it, it sort of it wasn't, in, in terms of the poll, it didn't come through as, as almost that important. Uh, I find that part of the time, I think firms aren't possibly aware what help they can get out there. Um, but I, I think overall, with the, the firms what I've dealt with over the years, I, I feel particularly that the, the more traditional ones really struggle in general with strategy. And I think the challenges that everyone has at this point in time, um, it's potentially a step too far, far for a lot of them. But, you know, you, you have to adapt or die, isn't it? That's that's the old thing. Um, it, it's a change for everyone. It's a change for us. I mean, the, the procurement world is changing because of, the way that people are operating, um, the ability to, you know, work more and more um, to, to be televisual uh, and to be able to work online, uh, work through conference calls, changes where a company is spending their money, uh, but throws other challenges that we're, we're talking to one firm we've dealt with for a long time about the environmental impact of people working from home and, and how that affects their sort of their own ratings. And it's obviously a big thing for them to be green, to be green and to be seen to be green and continue to do that. So the, the challenges come up for everyone. Um, and as I say, it's a case of, of, of having to adapt uh, as it comes along. Um, uh, as everyone says, it's not going to change for the foreseeable. So um, it, it's, uh, it's a new world to deal with. Jeremy, just picking up that green point for a minute, that's quite an interesting one. We haven't really covered that in massive depth through the weeks, but I mean, thank you, Andy, for it. I mean, to what extent does the, the, the fact you have an office, which is obviously very, I imagine, sort of eco-friendly in the sense of having all the, uh, the relevant savings, et cetera, but now if suddenly one's working from home in maybe drafty homes, which haven't therefore got that same green footprint to them, I mean, what, what, how, does, how do you reconcile that from a sort of firm-wide perspective? Good question. Um, yeah, I don't. I, I don't think we have at the moment uh, at all. It's, it's certainly, uh, the whole area of of uh, energy efficiency, green, diversity, inclusion, all, all these sort of areas are are moving up. It, they're probably the area that is moving up the agenda fastest. I would say at the moment. 
um, and uh, and we're getting more and more conscious of it. Probably um, slower than we we should have been doing, but I, but I but I suspect we're not much different to most other professional firms. Um, but it's certainly that whole area is certainly something that over the next five to 10 years is going to be a, see a massive change, I think, for professional firms. Massive change and a massive opportunity. I think there is an opportunity for us there as, as a firm of professional advisors to, to assist our clients in these areas as well. But at the moment, we're, 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 we're playing, I, I wouldn't say we're playing catch up, because that implies we're behind where the market is, but, 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 but I think we are, we, we are needing to speed up our work in those areas. Thanks, Jeremy. And I'm afraid that's now got to the stage of the show where I'm going to have to uh, thank our panel. I'd like to thank Victoria, uh, who's been on the show and has now joined the panel, which is fun. Thank you for that. Uh, for James, for his insight about we're all going to become televisual or being forced to. And Andy, for just reminding us that sometimes there's, if you lift the stone, there's, there's good things to be found underneath. So not to just discard potential savings and Jeremy for your honesty and thanking you for helping us uh, understand what's going on through I suspect many of your peers managing partner forum so I'd like to thank everybody on the, on the show today thank you for completing the the uh, poll uh, for those of you who want to obviously it will appear in the management library shortly and um, also the poll results so it only remains to say hope you found today valuable and please encourage your peers to book for future shows. I'm delighted that somebody signed up from Australia today from Perth. So we're definitely reaching out way beyond what you might expect. So um, who knows what the future brings. But next week, I know we have um, Michael, who's coming in from the, the Middle East. Uh, and he's coming in on his Saturday, so to speak, Friday out there. Uh, so it'd be interesting to hear what's going on there. So we do try and bring you different perspectives to help management retune their firm. On which happy note, thank you all very much and have a fantastic weekend when you get there. Bye for now.